Hello and welcome to the National Press Club and to another edition of the CALB Report, a monthly public policy forum co-sponsored by the George Washington University, the National Press Club, and the Shorenstein Center on Press Politics and Public Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. I'm Marvin Kalb, a senior fellow at the Shorenstein Center. Our subject and guest, Ted Koppel, back from the front. This program is being carried live by WMAL Radio here in Washington and by C-SPAN, which projects it across the country, and it is funded generously by the Knight Foundation. The embedding of more than 600 American and foreign reporters with U.S. and British troops during the Iraq War was the highlight of international coverage and a huge step forward in civilizing the relationship between the press and the Pentagon. It produced remarkable up-close reporting and made fans of Generals Tommy Franks and Richard Myers, even Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, not normally the first names to leap to mind as fans of American journalism. It was a risky strategy of media management, and it worked in the sense that the Pentagon was satisfied, the press was satisfied, and the public seemed to be satisfied. To the best of my knowledge, the only major network anchor to be embedded during the war was our guest, Ted Koppel, who returned from the front a little over a week ago. He was embedded, I think, for five weeks, five weeks with the 3rd Infantry Division, reporting for ABC News, and of course, his own program, Nightline. Ted, welcome back. Thank you. Let me just make a quick correction. David Bloom, who was also an anchor and who died tragically there, yes. was also in bed. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll stick with my description, but I'm, I'm glad for the correction. <laughs> I like the title. I was delighted, by the way, to see you back. And I know that your family was delighted to see you back. Yes. Let's start with this phenomenon of journalists being embedded. You've been quoted as saying you have zero complaints. Correct. Why zero complaints? I mean, nothing well, bothers you. Uh, let me put it this way. Um, my concern, and I was very skeptical before I went, uh, and I talked to uh, General Jack Keane, who was a four-star general at the Pentagon, went over to have a conversation with him beforehand, and I said, you have to understand that for me to leave uh, is a considerable risk for ABC News. If I get stuck over there in the desert with your troops and I can't do the things that you are saying we are going to be able to do, it would be more than a huge embarrassment. It would be a disaster for us and I'd have to try and get the hell out of there as fast as I can. And that may not be possible. So I would like you to tell me what it is you think I can do. And General Keene said, essentially, whatever you want to do. Um, he then gave me the name of the commanding general of the 3rd Infantry Division, and I called him while I was still here in the country. Where was he? Uh, he was at that time in Kuwait. Kuwait. And uh, his name is Buford Blunt, and I said, General Blunt, I'm calling because sometimes we are given assurances by the Pentagon or by the government or by spokespeople uh, and the people on the ground may not be fully familiar with all the commitments that have been made so I'd like to hear it from you. What is it that you feel I'm going to be able to do when I'm there and more to the point how much censorship is there going to be? Are there going to be times when you say those are pictures that you can't transmit back to the United States? Uh, and General Blount said to me, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I have absolute confidence in you. And as long, I mean, you understand what the ground rules are. The ground rules are that you not jeopardize an ongoing operation, that you not put any of the lives of the American troops in jeopardy. Uh, and I'm going to leave up to you the decision as to how you refrain from doing that. Um, I can't say that when someone makes a commitment to me and when someone promises me something and they then live up in all respects to that promise, as General Blunt did, uh, that it would be appropriate for me to have any complaints. If there, if there are any problems with my reporting, that was me. That was not That's that. That's a different story. 
That was a different story. How, Ted, does one, <coughs> you've given us an illustration of how you worked out becoming a better reporter. How does a reporter become an embedded reporter? Do, do you have to go to the Pentagon? Do you have to go through a certain training? Did you have to sign anything? Um, well, the, the training, I think, was really offered more for the benefit of the reporters. And again, uh, I pleaded special circumstances and said, look, there is no way that I can take a week off to go to one of these special training places. Uh, perhaps it will give you, the military, some sense of confidence that this is not the first war I've covered. Uh, I've been covering wars for 37 years now. Uh, spent three and a half years in and out of Vietnam, one year uh, in one full stretch, and then two and a half years in, in chunks. Uh, have covered about nine other wars since then. Uh, but I would like to get some special training in the biochemical warfare, you know, how to, how to wear that gear and how to put on the mask. Uh, and they made arrangements for me to go here to Fort Myer, uh, just across the river. And I spent a day there uh, in which several of my colleagues and I got training in uh, different kinds of landmines, uh, fundamental first aid, uh, field first aid. Uh, if you ever have a gaping, sucking chest wound, I'm your man. Um, and also in, in how to put on that, uh, that gas mask and the boots and the gloves and the biochemical suit. Frankly, was that training a whole lot of help? Uh, psychologically, I think it helped me a little bit. I'm sure that my colleagues who, who were able to spend five, six, seven days getting training were much better off than I was. Um, but again, I don't think the military was particularly concerned about having people come to take the training for their benefit. I think that was more for our benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you weren't Ted Koppel, how would you get embedded? Would you still have to sign something? Oh, I had to sign something. I what mean, is it that you had to sign? I had to sign a release that my attorney wife would blanch at even now in retrospect. <laughs> uh, what is it that was in the document? Uh, in the sign? document was that it's all my fault. <laughs> if what happened? If, if, if nasty things happened to me, that was, that was my problem, and I understood what I was getting into when I signed that document. But, I mean, was there, uh, you know, and there were... There was a, a typical Pentagonese list of rules of embedment, right. uh, which I got off the internet and, and promptly ignored. <coughs> I mean, promptly ignored in the sense that, uh, you know, I can summarize them for you, uh, as I did just a moment ago, don't do anything that's going to jeopardize the lives of American troops. Uh, Give us an illustration of something that could have happened, that you actually experienced, that might have jeopardized troops? Well, for example, uh, because the, there were only, I mean, there was my crew. We had a cameraman. How many people were you with, by the way? Uh, four, four others. Uh, the, the executive producer of Nightline, Leroy Sievers. We had a camera crew from Austria, husband and wife team, who were with us. Uh, and then we had an engineer who was the man responsible for getting that satellite so that, uh, you know, the satellite dish functioning when we, but he did much, much more than that, which we can get into later on. How much, <clears throat> how much of the, um, I remember a piece that Barry Dunsmore did for us at the Shorenstein Center about six years ago, in which he said that the two live broadcasts during the Persian Gulf War of 1991, one done by ABC, Forrest Sawyer did it, right. and one done by CBS. That it required almost a ton of equipment for each network. That a huge truck had to come along. What did you carry with you to do all of those broadcasts? Um, well, first of all, we had two vehicles. We had a civilian version of the Humvee, which is the right. sort of gigantic uh, latter-day Jeep. Uh, and on that Humvee, we had two generators, 
uh, one satellite dish, uh, and all kinds of equipment that, uh, that went with it. So it was a lot of stuff. That a lot you of were stuff. I mean, uh, you know, the idea, a, a, a thousand, I mean, uh, what are we talking about? 2,000 pounds, right? I always get, I, I get confused between Which the British ton, ton, the English ton, and the American ton. But I'm, I'm sure we had a ton of equipment with us. Because I was told that you could actually, two people could do a live piece from the war. Yes, they could. Uh, one person could do a live piece from the war. There were some of my colleagues who Television were, piece? Television pieces. Uh, there, were, there were some of my colleagues who carried with them uh, video phones, <coughs> which they were able to get going by themselves. Uh, wow. and, and in fact, my real admiration is for uh, the men and women uh, the technical people. No, not the technical but people. The, the reporters who were embedded. I was smart enough without knowing it. I, I went with the unit that uh, General Keene recommended that I go with, which was the 3rd <coughs> Mechanized <coughs> Infantry Division. The key word there <coughs> is mechanized. <laughs> um, the division has 20,000 people, and they had 10,000 vehicles. 10,000. Uh, and uh, that meant that we didn't do any walking. You don't walk. <laughs> you don't walk with a mechanized division. You roll with a mechanized division. Uh, so that whatever gear we had, we had aboard our two vehicles, aboard the Humvee, and then we, we additionally purchased a Land Rover in Kuwait City and, uh, uh, because we felt we needed even more. And since there were five of us, there, simply, uh, there wasn't enough room in the Humvee for all the gear. Uh, and for five people, uh, so we had two vehicles. Did you ever have a time during, the co during your coverage of the war when you and General Blunt disagreed about something? That you wanted to report something, but you checked it out with him and it didn't work? No, I'd, and, and honestly, I didn't no. check it out with him. That's not the way it worked. I mean, maybe it would be helpful if I just explained to you that, and, and I must say it, it astonished me as I began to sort of test the limits of, of what embedding meant and what access meant. Access was total. Hmm. They had an intelligence briefing. I sat in on the intelligence well, briefing. Well, hold it. I mean, was it that you sat in or that any embedded reporter could sit in? Well, I'm, I'm, I can only report on the situation that applied to uh, Michael Kelly, who was there for the Atlantic Monthly uh, and who tragically died while he was over there, uh, Michael and I could sit in on any briefing that they had. We sat in on their morning intelligence briefing. We sat in on their commander's briefings. And what the commander's briefing really entailed was we were with the division command. And then you had the various brigade and battalion commands uh, spread across the desert. I mean, the, I sort of had this image of the 3rd Infantry Division, 20,000 men and women strong, sort of in one lump. Uh, they were, of course, spread out over tens, if not hundreds, of square miles really? at different points. Uh, and there would be elements of the 3rd Infantry Division heading in one direction, elements heading in another direction. Uh, but to give you a sense, I mean, to answer more directly yeah. the kind of question you <coughs> asked before, um, I came to understand very early on that the, the intent of the 3rd Infantry Division was to deceive the Iraqis into believing that they were going to cross <coughs> a bridge across the Euphrates uh, near Nasiriyah, which was one of the first cities that we hit when we came into Iraq. In, in point of fact, their intent was never to do that. They took the bridge so that the Marines could cross, hmm. leaving the Iraqis with the impression that they were going to <coughs> cross, thereby drawing out Iraqi armor, Iraqi artillery, so that it could be destroyed by close air support, by some of the longbow helicopters, by some of the A-10 warthogs, by, uh, by some of the uh, B-1 bombers. Uh, and we can get into this a little bit later, I, I, I hope we do, what is absolutely, what was mind-boggling to me was the degree of coordination that existed 
between the Army, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps, but particularly <coughs> between the Army and the Air Force, mm. to the point that when an, uh, an Iraqi artillery piece fired a shell, that position of that artillery piece would be fixed by American radar almost instantaneously. They would have the grid, they would pass the grid on to the planes that were already on station circling overhead. They would pass it on to the American artillery, uh, American rocket uh, launchers. And within three and a half to five minutes, that artillery piece would be gone, would be bombed, or hit by US artillery. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Iraqis, up mm -hmm. until the very end, understood how quickly and how smoothly and how efficiently that worked. Hmm. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, but to get back but to Ted, the... But Ted, did you... Did, excuse me. Just... Uh, Go finish your point. Let me just finish this point, because to get back to the bridge crossing in mm -hmm. Nasiriyah, I knew from about the third day on, because I'd been in on the intelligence briefings, that the, that the 3rd Infantry Division actually planned to pass through the Karbala Gap and then go for a destination that they called Peach, which was another bridge across the, uh, across the Euphrates River. You described this in one of the programs you did. Right. That hour-long program. Um, now, let us say that I, had, that I had shared that piece of information early on. Uh, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that if the <coughs> Iraqis had learned through American television that the feint over the Euphrates River right. near Nasiriyah <coughs> and two subsequent feints across other bridges uh, crossing the Euphrates River, that those were never intended to be the, the approach or the avenue of approach for the 3rd Infantry Division. That, in point of fact, it was going to be in another place altogether. Obviously, that would have been helpful to the Iraqis. Obviously, that would have cost a lot of American lives. And so that we understand, or at least I understand it, this was some information that you were able to pick up just sitting at an intelligence briefing. And, and also because General Blunt shared it with me from the first. I mean, when I said, what's the plan, he told me. <laughs> it's a remarkable trust that a military man would have in a reporter. Yes. And, and, and really tremendously inhibiting. I mean, it's, it's one thing, as most of us are accustomed to as journalists, to have to sort of wheedle little pieces of information out of sources that we have cultivated for years. And then you take a little piece here, and you take a little piece there, and you put it together, and you arrive at a conclusion. Nothing is more difficult for a reporter than for a general to say, here's the plan. Now, you know, don't give anything away that could be damaging to the enemy. I mean, they're true. Did he have to say that, or did you no, sort of knew it? No, I mean, that's, that's sort of it was in, implied and inferred. I mean, it's, uh, there it was. It, I, I understood that part of it. I really did. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question right here, which kind of plays off that, I guess. So you were engaged during the coverage of the war in a kind of self-censorship. Yes. Sure. Now give me an example, another one that you just gave me. Give me another one. Um, I knew, for example, at a given point that the uh, US forces were using unmanned um, aerial vehicles, these sort of pilotless drones that they use that have cameras. And there was great concern. They were using them over Baghdad to see where some of the enemy forces <coughs> were massing in Baghdad. Um, and General Blunt made it very clear to me that this was something that he really did not want me to report on, certainly for the first day. Um, and again... The so he asked you he in asked, this particular case? In that particular instance, he said, again, let me tell you what we're doing, but please don't use that part of it. You can use anything else. I mean, I knew, for example... Um, I think before anybody else did, because <laughs> there I was at division headquarters, and when I say before, not because I was a better reporter, I just happened to be a reporter sitting there with the commanding general. W uh, were you the only one sitting with him? No, Michael Kelly and I were the, the only two. The only two. Uh, and we had another advantage, because we were at 
uh, and it turned out to be a tragic disadvantage for Michael Kelly. Uh, yes. uh, because we were with division headquarters, Michael and I constantly were struggling with this problem. If we stayed with division headquarters, we would usually be a couple of miles back from the front. Uh, so we didn't see most of the action. We knew everything that was going on. I mean, we could sit in there, in their command tent, and we could listen to the reports coming in from all the brigade commanders as to precisely what was going on. So we had complete knowledge, no access to the front line. And finally, when we got to within, I guess about four days of Baghdad, just before we crossed the Euphrates River, Michael and I reached the same decision that we really needed to get up with a battlefront unit. That we, we knew what the plan was. We knew what they were going to do. We knew when they were going to do it. There really wasn't a great deal more to be gained by staying uh, with the division command. And so both of us went up front. And on the second day that Michael went up front, he was killed. Ted, did you ever have the feeling when you were talking to General Blunt that he might not be telling you the truth? Um, no, I, I really did not. And I, I must tell you, uh, one of the things that impressed me most about him was uh, I would sometimes go into the, t I mean, these, these generals. And you would just drop in yeah, to his tent? Absolutely. It's I not mean, a prearranged briefing or no, something? No, no, no. I mean, there is a, there was a <coughs> command tent wherever they went. Uh, and in that command tent would be at least one, usually two generals, General Blunt and, and his deputy, General Austin, who was yes. a, a brigadier general. Uh, one of the two of them, most of the time, both of them were there almost 24 hours a day. Okay. Uh, general Austin, I would say, was there 22 <coughs> hours a day throughout the entire four weeks that we were moving from the border up to, to Baghdad. Uh, Michael and I could walk into that tent at any time, sit down, start taking notes. I could walk in with my camera. The only thing, and, and again, most of the time they asked me not to bring in the camera crew, but if I wanted to bring the camera in and shoot, which I did on numerous occasions, really? that was okay. It You're was, violating union rules or something? Uh, <laughs> union rules in, in Iraq these days are somewhat looser. Than, 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 um, and, and the main reason was that there were a lot of people jammed into that tent and they simply didn't want sure. another three people sure. in there. Uh, the, only, the only inhibition was please don't show the map because the map, again, was showing where they were headed and how they planned to get there. And the extraordinary thing about these maps is they had the maps in the sort of old-fashioned way that you expect to see a map. That map was replicated in probably a thousand vehicles mm -hmm. or more. Mm -hmm. Every one of those M1A1 tanks, those Abrams tanks, had a little computer in it which had that same map. And the map would show uh, little icons for every American unit in blue and little icons in red for every Iraqi unit. And when that unit moved, the icon moved. And they would know at all times who was where. Uh, one of the most extraordinary things to me about the, you know, the number of people in that tent, you had intelligence officers in the tent, you also had lawyers in the tent. <laughs> Why? The 3rd Infantry Division traveled with, I believe the number is correct, 16 lawyers and 30 paralegals <laughs> from the Judge Advocates Group. Why? Uh, because you will come up with legal questions. For example, we have a tank that is parked right next to a school or a mosque. Can we target that tank? And the lawyer will say, only if the tank opens fire. If the tank is just sitting there and hasn't opened fire, legally you cannot fire <coughs> on that tank. I mean, I must say, in terms of Amazing. being... In terms of being impressed with certain things about the U.S. military, uh, and uh, I'm not usually impressed by lawyers, but the fact that lawyers... You? My, my, <laughs> my wife being the one notable exception. Um, 
But the fact that, that the U.S. Army travels with all these damn lawyers. Amazing. Right? It's who amazing are, fact. Who are telling these generals, General, you're the general. You can do whatever you want, but I'm telling you that is not an appropriate target. And, you know, then, of course, we came up against the, you probably remember when there was that tragic incident where a taxi driver yes. drew up, uh, drove up to a roadblock, ended up, he was a suicide bomber, killing four uh, members of the 3rd Infantry Division. Thereafter, and I was with a, a tank commander when this actually happened, while mm -hmm. we were there and we were shooting it, uh, a car comes driving down the road toward the tank. The tank commander starts waving his arms to the, to, to the tank to stop it. The car does not stop. He orders his machine gunner to fire warning shots. The car still did not stop. And he then ordered him to put one in the engine block, which he did. And then the car <coughs> stopped. The, the driver was not injured. We had left a camera in that tank, which we had attached to the, the outside of the tank so that when they moved and went into action, we would get that particular image. We went back the next day, and the, the same tank commander, a very impressive young lieutenant, was absolutely shaken up because the night we left him, we drove back to go back to brigade command, we left him, came back to see him the next day, a group of 30 civilians came walking down the road toward his tank. And again, he issued the warning for them to stop. His gunner noticed that in the center of the group of civilians, there were two or three men <coughs> carrying Kalashnikov rifles, AK-47s. He had warning shots fired, at which point two vehicles came on either side of the road, and people in the vehicles threw weapons to the civilians. Wow. <coughs> he had to kill them all. Now, and he did. And he did. Now, this was just hours after he had shown really extraordinary restraint, and we, we sort of went away saying, wow, this is how it's supposed to work. Right. No, nobody got hurt. He did all the right things. Um, those are, I mean, as I look back on it, or as I examined it while I was there, those are exactly the reasons why some very smart people at the Pentagon, I think, decided that it was a good idea to have us there. Imagine how that story would have played out. Uh, I mean, it, it could have played out badly anyway, but we had just been with that very tank commander, and he had followed the regulations to the letter. So that when I came back the next day and mm -hmm. he told me that story, I was, I was inclined to believe him. Uh, and you did. And I did. Yeah. yeah. Ted, before um, the 3rd Infantry Division actually crossed the Kuwaiti border into Iraq, you did a program and you, were, you went around interviewing some of the soldiers and you asked them whether they had butterflies in their stomach. And I was wondering if you had any. Oh, yeah. Um, I, was, I was very worried about the chemical weapons. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they really do train you, and you train yourself. I mean, I practiced. When I was still sitting in Kuwait, I would rip that bag open and see if I could get that mask on in nine seconds or less. Um, that nine seconds is what it's supposed to that's be? That's what it's supposed to be. You're supposed to be able to get that mask on in nine seconds or less. What really worried me, though, was the night that we were going through the Karbala Gap. That was the time, uh, and General Blunt and I had had an interesting conversation in which at one point I had said to him, look, I bet you're a quarter that Saddam doesn't use chemical weapons. And he said, I won't even bet you a quarter because I don't think he will either. Nevertheless, the time that the expectations of chemical weapons being used were highest, were as this massive force of 20,000 troops and 10,000 vehicles was being squeezed through the funnel of the Karbala Gap. The Karbala Gap is a little more than a mile wide, which seems pretty wide. And it's about 40 or 50 miles south of Baghdad. That's right? correct. 
uh, and you've got the city of Karbala to your east, and, then the and you've got this massive dam and, and reservoir to your west. If there was going to be any point at which the Iraqi troops were going to lie in wait for the U.S. 3rd Infantry Division to come through there, that was going to be it. And we, we left our desert position at 2 o'clock in the morning, pitch dark. The idea was to hit the Karbala Gap at 4 o'clock in the morning, pitch dark. We are driving in absolute darkness. Uh, and quite apart from the fact that you don't want to lose the vehicle in front of you, which is pretty easy to do in the dark, my concern was if and when they use chemical weapons, how will we know? I mean, we were taking, at that point, all kinds of incoming fire. There was incoming mortar fire, there was incoming artillery fire, there was incoming rocket fire. You said at one point that a lot of this was quite close. Uh, some of it was quite close. Uh, and again, how do you know? Under normal circumstances, by daylight, when you can see all these guys, they would make, you know, if, whoever is the first one to figure out that there is a chemical weapon being used out there. I mean, they had vehicles, they call them Fox vehicles, which are the, the chemical biological testing vehicles. And these guys would go out in front, and they would be testing the atmosphere at all times. And if for some reason they they saw something or detected something, they would issue the warning, and people would protectively put the masks on. Didn't happen often. But how would we know? So was I, did I have butterflies? That's understatement. And when the, and when the incoming rounds were a bit close, did you feel any, any danger that, whoops, wrong place at the wrong yeah, time? Yeah, whoops is a word that occurred to me. <laughs> Um, sure, but, you know, that, I must tell you, Marvin, the, uh, of course it's frightening, but, again, I think you can sort of operate on a, uh, you know, what, what are the odds? What are the odds that it's going to hit my vehicle, or the shrapnel is going to hit my vehicle? And, you, you know, you take a lot of comfort in what are probably stupid calculations that you're making at that time. But do you take comfort from the fact that you are literally surrounded also by a lot of wonderful American soldiers? Yeah, but you're not surrounded. You're not? No, there's, there's, there's a vehicle in front of you, and a vehicle in front of him, and another vehicle in front of him, yeah. and there's a vehicle behind you. Uh, the artillery shell coming in doesn't really draw any distinction there between and among vehicles. So you were open to the same kind of dangers in that sense that the troops were? No, we were actually open to much greater danger than the troops were. Because you didn't were. have the guns? No, because we didn't have an armored vehicle. Uh, you know, if you're sitting inside uh, an Abrams tank, an Abrams tank can take a remarkable amount of explosives mm. And, and nobody inside is injured. If you're sitting inside a Bradley fighting vehicle, it doesn't have quite the resilience of an Abrams. But again, you can, you can take quite a hit. Uh, some of the Humvees that the military had were armored. Ours was a civilian Humvee. It was not armored. And our little Land Rover was... <laughs> not only was it not armored, the clutch was going out on it. <laughs> Ted, you had a, a little bit of a a public spat with one of your colleagues at ABC, Charlie Gibson, on the issue of whether uh, television pictures of wounded or killed civilians or s soldiers ought to be yeah. shown. Yeah. And Charlie referred to it as disrespectful uh, to show them, and that you said that war is horrible and you have to show the pictures of that horror. Any uh, second thoughts on that judgment? None at all. Um, in, indeed, having seen this war, my great concern is that a great many of the young soldiers who have fought it um, have never had an opportunity to see the enemy face to face. You know, if you're firing an artillery piece uh, whose shell goes five miles, 10 miles, or, you know, one of these rockets that can go 40 or 80 miles or even further. 
or if you're up in a, uh, you know, if you're up in an A10, or you're up in a in a B1. A10 is what? An A10 is uh, they they call it a flying tank. It is a fairly heavily armored, slow flying uh, vehicle. They call it the Warthog, which has. Is that a jet? Hmm? Is it a jet plane? Yeah, but it, it, it flies very, very slowly. I mean, it is capable of flying at, you know, like, I don't know, 150 miles an hour, which, uh -huh. which for these planes is very, very slow. And they have uh, these, these cannon that I can best describe as being like a Gatling gun. You remember the Gatling machine yes. gun, which sort of turns and is capable of firing? I, I forget what it is. They fire something like 2,000 rounds a minute, hmm. maybe more than that. The, is there a military expert here? There must be. Lots. There always is in Washington. <laughs> um, but I mean, they are devastating. Mm -hmm. They can cover an, the area of an entire football field with bullets in one sweep. Wow. Uh, and you know, even as they're going by, and even though they're going by slowly, they don't see a whole lot of, I mean, they'll see what they do to a vehicle if it explodes, but they don't really see the people. And it occurs to me that particularly with these laptop computers that all these guys carry with them, where everything is an icon, right? uh, it takes on some of the attributes of a game. Uh, I mean, one of these, one of these. You mean uh, the targeting takes on the attributes of a game? Yes, I'm. I'm, I'm saying that by the, the military. Yeah, I'm saying that when you are when you are looking at. A computer screen, right? And when the enemy, in this instance, half a dozen human beings, right, the Iraqis, are sitting in a tank, or there are three of them, four of them in a tank, and the icon is destroyed. The icon goes away. It's no longer there. Mm -hmm. The sense that you have actually taken some human lives as you do that. I'm not saying there's any. You know, oh, that's what happens in war. We send our young men and women out to kill the other guys, young men and women. And we did that much more efficiently than the Iraqis did in this case. But I think in order to understand the gravity of war, that at the very least what you do for the American public is you say, people die. People get injured. Now, do you show the face of the dead, whether he be Iraqi or American? No, I don't think you do. But do you show a a body lying there in these sort of terrible positions that bodies take on when someone has just been violently killed? I think you do. I think people have to understand that war is a dreadful thing. And, uh, you know, as I come back now, and I'm back for a week, I can already sense the American public beginning to lose interest. I mean, this one's over, it's behind us, we did very well, thank you, it was great. Uh, you know, we, we carry on these extraordinary ceremonies for prisoners of war and treat them as heroes. Uh, I'm not saying they're not terrific young soldiers, but the heroes were the young men who went in to get them. The POWs were victims. Uh, I think it's wonderful that they be welcomed home, but I think sometimes we lose sight of what we're really trying to say. Do you think television presented then to a sanitized division of this war? Yes, I do. Why? Um, because we don't want to offend the viewers. No, is it a con did we have the did we have the pictures, but made a conscious decision not to show them? Well, honestly, I can't tell you what was going on back here. Well, what did judging, you do? With judging from, I mean, what we did on Nightline is we showed them, and and that was done deliberately. And we did it deliberately because uh, both of my producers and I felt that that was the right thing to do. That if you can do it in, in such a fashion as not to show the faces, not to show it in such a way that it humiliates the dead, I think you know, the very least you can do for a, a dead soldier of either side is acknowledge the fact that he died in combat. It's not just another statistic. This is a human being who died. Do you think in the way in which you covered the war that you yourself actually saw a lot of, of the dead? I mean, from the, the way you describe it, for a lot of the time you were 
what, sort of back a couple of miles? Yeah. And then uh, you and Michael made the call toward the end to go up front? Right. Now, what we did tend to see, I mean, long before we went up front, right. we, we would see the aftermath. And sometimes the aftermath entailed bodies, and sometimes it didn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the extraordinary things about this war is that I think there were very few bodies to be seen. I was going to say that in the, the coverage. The, the uh, Iraqis themselves, I think, were at great pains to try to recover bodies as quickly as they could, just, really? as, just as the U.S. military does. Right. You recover the bodies and you bring them back, just as you bring back the wounded. Ted, let me ask you, I, I mentioned before the study that Barry Dunsmore, our friend and colleague, did at the, uh, at the Shorenstein Center back in 1996, I see. I want to ask you about this kind of interesting that you and Dan Rather of CBS were kind of on opposite sides of this question. Uh, Rather thought that the idea of live coverage of a war was a, um, a good thing. Technologically, it could be done, reporters could do it. You were skeptical. In fact, you had serious doubts about it. And you said, among other things, you simply cannot have that meaning an ongoing war, and at the same time, an unedited rendition of what was going on on the battlefield. There just has to be some application of common sense here. Mm -hmm. Now, in the midst of covering this war, you were participating in live coverage. You were also, when doing pieces for Nightline, editing pieces and presenting them. Do you feel that there w I mean, have, has your thinking changed in any way about the advisability and now the technological obviousness of live coverage of a war? No. I, I hold, I mean, I hold all the views I held before. Uh, the only thing that I must confess shocked me, which I have already confessed, is that the degree of access was so total uh, that had this war gone on, as long as some of the commanders feared it uh -huh. would. And again, I mean, you ask about the kinds of things we knew, uh, the kinds of things that Michael and I knew. I knew that the commanders of the 3rd Division were very concerned about a long siege of Baghdad. That as, you know, April turned into May and May turned into June and the temperatures that were then about 90 degrees, became 110 degrees and 120 degrees. How high did the temperatures go? The temperatures in the, in the summer, the temperatures in the desert can go up to 140. No, while you were there. While we were there, uh, I guess the highest was about 95. But when you're wearing the biochemical suits, the ambient temperature inside your suit is anywhere from 10 to 20 degrees higher than it is outside. How heavy is that suit? It's, it's not all that heavy, no. and, and, and let me tell you something that you don't know about biochemical suits. They are lined with charcoal, um, which is really kind of terrific because while it is designed to keep these nasty chemicals from getting in, it also keeps your nasty smell from getting out. <laughs> so even though, you know, even though it's very hot in those suits, um, <laughs> they, they weren't bad. I mean, you know, we were, we were able to abide one another. Uh. <laughs> you know, in, a, in another program that we did together at the Brookings and Harvard Forum in October of 2001, I'm betting back to live coverage now. You spoke of live coverage in general, not just in a war situation, as, quote, a half a dozen evolutionary steps back. Yeah. Rather, you put it, than an evolutionary step forward. And the question was why, and you said because good journalism requires time to think and reflect and actually uh, to report. So my question is, what specifically has changed now in your sense of live coverage? Um, we're talking about two different things here, Mark. Go ahead. I mean, you're, you're talking about live coverage, and I'm talking about total access. I'm, I'm Talk enamored. Talk about live coverage first. Yeah, I'm enamored of total access. Oh. I think no more of live coverage than I ever did. Uh, I mean, I once got into a lot of trouble with our, with our good friends and colleagues who are 
cameramen and, and videographers and photographers because I said pointing a camera at an event is technology, it's not journalism. By that, I never meant to imply that what these great journalists do is not journalism. Of course. What I meant to imply was that if you simply point a live camera at an event and beam it back to the United States, that's not journalism. Journalism requires sifting the wheat from the chaff, putting things into some kind of a context, deciding what to use and what not to use, giving the whole thing some kind of a framework. That's what journalism is about. So I have no different feelings today about live coverage than I ever did. It is a technological phenomenon. Uh, I mean, the, the, the capacity that David Bloom's, I mean, what they ended up calling the Bloommobile, I guess, uh, the, the capacity that that vehicle had to be able to feed live pictures back as they are rolling along. We didn't have that capacity. We had to stop and set up our dish before we could beam pictures back. But NBC had, had created this terrific vehicle, which was capable of sending back pictures instantaneously. So would that run more the danger of what you're concerned about? It, it does. That I'm, there isn't time to think through issues? I think it's, uh, you know, obviously there isn't time. I mean, when something... You're in a live situation. When something as, as emotionally absorbing as a war is going on all around you, I kind of think you need to be able to, at some point or another, step back and say, all right, now we've got all these pictures. At the end of the hour, at the end of the three-hour time block, what actually happened here? Because basically all you're capable of doing while the bullets are flying is sort of doing a running commentary and probably not a very accurate running commentary at that because I assure you, you can't tell where they're coming from when they're being fired at you. You can't really tell what is being fired at because the distance is so great. These things happen at a distance. I mean, you know, even with, uh, you know, I mean, even a sniper can fire a mile away mm. or a mile and a half away. But these tanks and these, these Bradleys and these rockets, the multiple launch rockets, they're firing at targets that are, you know, 30, 50, 80 miles away. You have no so, idea what's so going on. So that in that sense, Ted, Secretary Rumsfeld was right, that you're getting each embedded reporter is, in effect, providing a slice right. of reality. And it's kind of a narrow slice. It is where you are. It is where the camera is pointing. Uh, but if you are in this hot, constant, flushed environment of war, how do you have the time to sit back and think? You are obviously going to report what it is that you see. Right. And, so, and, and my concern there is, as you know, because right. we've, we've been friends a long time right. and have talked right. about this a lot, right. my concern is that as, as galvanizing as it must be for the American viewer to sit at home and watch wars unfold, as they happen, here it is in your living room, in your bedroom, in your kitchen. I think it's bad journalism. But you can't go home again, can you? I mean, uh, you, 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 can't, you can't put that particular genie back in the bottle. Uh, and while our colleagues over at CNN and MSNBC and Fox, I think do a superb job of trying very hard to do that as mm -hmm. well as it can possibly be done. And while they also do a terrific job at other times during the broadcast day of putting things into context, mm -hmm. live coverage of a war is, I mean, to, to describe that as live journalism is, I think, an oxymoron. Um, okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about what cable television news did um, as compared with traditional network news. What they did do during this war in Iraq was attract a much larger audience than they ever had before. That's true. Including MSNBC, which had a very small audience, and that went up something like 125% over the period of the war. And CNN went up considerably, and, and Fox went up considerably as well. 
And what we learned is that the ratings for cable skyrocketed, but the ratings for the traditional newscasts, I don't know about Nightline, by the way. Actually, Nightline's ratings went up about between 30 and 40 percent. They did go up that yeah. high. Well, that's extraordinary. Congratulations on that. The evening newscasts, however, CBS and ABC went down. No, they didn't. Uh, they, they also... Every newscast... Every, no. Can I go through about 13 articles here? Sure, you go, you go ahead. The, uh, the, the vaunted New York Times, which did an article, which did indeed <coughs> say that. You're a good reporter. You, it's not just you, the New York Times. Yeah, but they got it wrong. They were just wrong. Everybody got it wrong. Everybody got it wrong. Um, <laughs> the, the comparisons were made to not where they were before the war started and where they were after the war. The comparisons were actually made to the same period last year. In other words, in March or April of last year, they had X, and this year they had X plus 50 percent, 100 percent. And uh, to the best of my understanding, World News Tonight, for example, their ratings went up about 12, 13 percent. Ted, you're giving me a bulletin because it hasn't been reported anywhere. Okay. You ought to get it on the show but, tonight. But even there, I mean, let me just, you know, if I say something is this big, and it grew to that big, that's 300%. That sounds like a hell of a lot. If World News Tonight goes up 10% and MSNBC goes up 300%, they still haven't gone up a fraction of what World News Tonight went up because 10% yeah, of enough. 12 million people would be 1.2 million and MSNBC going up 300% from its normal viewership of 60,000 would be, you know. Fair enough. I've never won an argument with you anyway, so I'm not going to even try to win this one. Um, we've got about four or five minutes left. I want to uh, ask you about something that General Myers said recently at a, at a press conference. He was speaking about two large positive results from the embedding phenomenon. And one of them was, in his view, that it may wash away some of the press cynicism of government his terminology, not mine. And that too, as a side benefit, it may end up educating a new generation of journalists as to what he called the character of those who serve in the US military. And I'm getting the sense of what you have already said, that you yourself have learned and come to appreciate a lot better than you had before. I would, I would the agree. The quality of the people. I would agree with, with the second half of what General Myers said. Uh, I come away from the experience of dealing uh, with the third division, the commanders of the third division, the young men as seen from, from our vantage point. I mean, these are guys who are in their late 30s, early 40s, who are like young colonels, men. colonels, young men. Extraordinary people, really extraordinary people, enormously impressed. Great. I was enormously impressed by them. Have I lost my cynicism for government? Hell no. <laughs> Isn't the Pentagon and the military part of the government? Uh, they're part of the government. So? So just because I approve of one part doesn't mean that I've you lost my cynicism. You mean you disapprove citizen. of the rest of government? Let me, I don't think you mean that. Let me be more explicit. Uh, my level of cynicism about the reasons that took us to war against Iraq remain just as well developed as they were before I went. You had a very Le cynical view of the reasons I did. for the war? Um, Hold on. Having the, the young men and women who carried out the orders of their civilian masters did it in a brilliant fashion. They worked hard. They are to be admired. I come away with and, and I would add only to what General Meyer said, I actually think that a lot of those commanders came away with a better appreciation of what we of do. Of the media as well. Of the media. I think that there was, you know, in many instances, there was a mutual admiration society that built up. That they were very impressed by the fact that so many men and women were willing to, you know, without asking any special favors, without asking for any particular special treatment, uh, that they were willing to do what they did. I really think the relationship 
I, I can't remember a time in recent memory since Vietnam when the relationship between the reporter on the ground mm -hmm. and the troops on the ground was better. But let's not confuse that with, you know, they did what they were told to do. Was what they were told to do necessary? I, the jury's still out on that one. And, okay. and I think that's going to be the subject of long and sustained debate for years to come. There's no question about that. We've got a little more than a minute. Newsday and a number of other newspapers did kind of report cards on press coverage. And I'm happy to tell you, student, that you got an A. Good. Um, <laughs> Newsday said, Koppel proved conclusively and single-handedly that the Disney bean counters who wanted to drop them a year ago are knuckleheads. <laughs> and I want to know, I want to know whether anybody from Disney called you to apologize, to congratulate, what? No, I, I got very, very gracious phone calls from everyone from Michael Eisner on down. Terrific. Uh, they were very, very pleased and very gracious. Did any part of the reason for your going to cover the war have to do with that incident with Disney last year? It was because you wanted to go on this convergence idea of you access and, I, and technology. Exactly. I mean, right. you, and I, you and I talked about right. it before I went, and I just thought this was something I didn't believe it was going to happen. I really didn't believe it was going to happen. You know, a very good source told me just the other day, very good source, you will not contradict her. No, I won't that she hoped that this would be the last war you cover. <laughs> will you tell her now that this is the last war you will cover? I don't have to tell her now. I told her from the, from the sands of Iraq. Okay. That it was going to okay. be the last war. And I have a helmet. Which to prove has it? Ted's <laughs> last war. Really? Emblazoned on the side. Absolutely. Was that something given to you or? What, what was no, no, this? No, 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 I, I wrote it. You wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Ted, let me just uh, finish in this way that the St. Petersburg Times, in its final report cut on war coverage, said the following. The Nightline host sometimes spends a little too much time hanging out with the military brass. But watching this energetic man with the 3rd Infantry Division, keeping pace with soldiers one-third his age, <laughs> while recalling times hunting stories in Vietnam, remains an inspiring demonstration of quality journalism. Thank you. I want to thank the Knight Foundation for their support. Without that support, we couldn't do programs of this sort. And finally, I want to thank Ted Koppel for giving us his time, for sharing his experiences, his extraordinary experiences covering this war. And as a fan and, and a dear friend, I am so glad you're back. Thank you. I'm Marvin Kalb. Good night and good luck. Thank you.